Hello, my name's Alan Paul, and this is a video about Kingmaker II, the new version of Kingmaker uh, that I developed as part of the Kingmaker package produced by Gibsons in March 2024. We're going to do a three-player game setup. So what you will need is a Kingmaker II rulebook. And if you'd like to follow along, um, the setup instructions are on page 7, and they're going to be fairly rigorous going through the text of that. So without further ado, let's get on with it. First thing we do is find the board. Uh, there are, the board is two-sided. Uh, this is the Kingmaker II board, it says here. The other side is the classic one, which we don't need. So we'll set the board up. We do need a fairly large table. What I'll do here is I'll set it up and we'll put the board quite well out of the way so you can still see the components as I um, as I show how you set them up. So the first bit done. Second bit is find the royal pieces and put them on the board. So we'll do that. The royal pieces, there are seven. They're square tiles, counters, and they look like these. Uh, I'll do these in... Um, I'll put these out here in order of succession. So we have Henry VI, king at the start of the game. Um, we have Margaret of Anjou, who is second in line, his, his wife. We have Edward of Westminster, who is their son. And notice these are square, um, double-sided counters. You turn them over, they have a king on the other side. Um, at the start, only Henry... We'll use that side. If you crown another heir, you've just flipped the, count the counter over. The so those are the Lancastrians. The Yorkists consist of Richard of York, Edward, Earl of March, George, Duke of Clarence, and Richard, Duke of Gloucester. So we'll just put these on the board. I am not an expert at this kind of thing, so please bear with me if my video goes a bit wild at times. So... We are going to start by putting on the Lancastrians. Start with Henry. Henry goes in London. He starts in London. Margaret starts in Kenilworth. Edward of Westminster starts in Coventry, just north of where Margaret is. Notice the Lancastrians are all fairly central. In contrast, the Yorkists are around the outside. So um, Richard, Duke of York, starts in York. Edward, Earl of March, starts over here in North Wales in Harlech. George of Clarence starts in Cardigan, which is an open town, so anybody can grab George of Clarence. And finally, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, starts down here in Calais. So those are our royal pieces set up. The next thing that we do is we look at the crown cards. Uh, Kingmaker the second uses 74 crown cards. It's the first set of crown cards, uh, the first 74 numbered crown cards in the deck, which makes it relatively easy to find them when you're starting out. Um, and I've cheated slightly because I've sorted them, but here we have the crown deck and um, the, other, the other ones that I've sorted, because I'm going to use the preset factions here. Um, and the next thing we do when we found the crown cards is if we're using the preset factions, which is an option for, for people starting out with Kingmaker the two, we can use these cards. They are useful because they each card lists the starting crown cards for that particular faction. So <clears throat> here are the here are the, uh, the preset faction cards for three players. We have Beaufort, Courtney, and Talbot. Um, so let's put those down there. Now, uh, as I said, I've sorted them already. Um, the the uh, the idea of the preset factions is that they give you a give each player a reasonable and reasonably balanced starting position. So in this case, if we look at Beaufort, Beaufort starts with two titled nobles, two untitled nobles, a couple of offices, a title which can be awarded to one of the untitled nobles, one bishop, a couple of towns. And a couple of mercenaries. The, the purpose of the balancing here is so that everybody has roughly 250 troops, not exactly the same. So they have the ability to, to capture 
one of the fortified places that contains a royal, for example, Kenilworth or Coventry, um, they only re they have a garrison of 200, so you can capture one of those, or Harlech for that matter. But nobody has sufficient to capture a head of the house, either Henry the uh, Sixth or Richard, because they are both in cities, and cities have garrisons of, of 300. So um, we have got the preset faction cards, and we have selected those um, those particular cards and put them by their faction cards. Now, I do that. I normally keep the crown deck sorted so that I have the titled nobles, untitled nobles, officers, etc., by type, and often alphabetically by type. So I can very swiftly find the right cards for any of the preset factions and get set up very, very quickly indeed. So the rest of the crown deck, we shuffle it up. These are already shuffled, but we shuffle the rest of the crown deck. And put that face down on the board in its position right at the top. So that goes all the way up there where it says crown deck there. And next to that is the crown deck discard pile. So they go in there. Now, the very next thing we do is there's a section called chancery. We turn over cards from the top of the crown deck until we have two titles and or offices and put them in chancery. Chancery is the place where um, cards go from deceased nobles. The, the offices and titles of deceased nobles go in there. And we also seed them at the start of the game. And if you hold a parliament during the game, you can pick up those and often award them to your own side. So we take a look. The very first card is the Marshal of England. <laughs> so Marshal of England goes into Chancery. We only want offices and titles. Remember, that's offices are the, the yellow ones and titles are the orange ones. Um, and we keep turning up until we have another office or title. We have a title, Earl of Salisbury. He goes in. Now they go face up in in Kingmaker 2. So that is that is common knowledge. So people know that if you call Parliament, you're going to get the Marshal. That's really helpful to know. And what we would now do is reshuffle those back into the deck. I'll just leave them there for the moment. Right, so we have done that bit. Let's put this back into its case. We're going to come back to these uh, faction crown cards in a moment. But first of all, we need to find the victory cards and put them in the right space. The victory card space is all the way at the top of the deck, and there are two relevant victory cards. There is royalty victory. This is the traditional victory condition for uh, Kingmaker. It's having the last surviving royal piece crowned as king or, or queen regent. So this one will go right at the top of the board in a second. The second, the second one is prestige victory. Now, there are two prestige victory sides, a two-player, three-player, and a four player and five player on the other side. So we only need, we don't need a four and five, so we get rid of that one. We just need the three player. And it specifies on here how many points you need to, how many prestige points you need to win the game. So we'll put both of these cards at the top of the board where it says victory cards. All the way at the top right, and I usually put these so that the prestige victory is on top so that people can easily refer to the point value there. So we have got to that stage. Excellent. And turn over the next bit. And this is setting up all the other uh, cards that go down the right hand right hand side of the board. So we'll do we'll do those. And these are all in a deck here. So I'll just stick this on here for the moment and see. So we have city cards. There are four cities, Bristol, York, Norwich, and London. And they go, strangely enough, where it says city cards. Notice they all have on them this prestige symbol. That's so you can easily count up the prestige of each faction. We have a number of major battle and siege cards. These, if you win a major battle, which is a a battle with an office holder on both sides, you gain two points. Again, these prestige point things are indicated. Or a major siege, similarly, we only gain one point for a major siege. And they just live there. And when you win a major battle, you can allocate that to a noble who was present there. Then there are 
royal, royal cards. Again, the purpose of these really is to show the prestige points, is to show who controls that particular royal, royal piece and how many prestige points you get. On the back of each one of these is the variable prestige points. You get four if it's Soul King, three if it's one or two kings, and two if it's uncrowned. And we have Henry VI, Margaret of Anjou, and Elder Westminster go on the Lancastrian section. So that is that is those. <clears throat> the next thing we have to do is find the player aids. Now the game comes with four player aids, and I have a copy of the player aid up here. This is a, a very useful quick reference sheet, and um, it covers sequence of play, succession, how you get prestige points, and then inside we have the terrain chart which which goes through the, the key on the map tells you what they mean a a table of odds for combat including how to calculate odds with a smartphone or calculator and on the back we have location group references for all of the locations on the board so uh, you'll notice on the board there is the numbers along the bottom letters up the side so if we look at here, we could have like Barnard Castle, <laughs> randomly picked there, 3F. So we look at the three and all the way up to F up here. And there we have Barnard Castle right at the top there. So you can easily find all the locations using that player aid. So there are four of them. So in a three player game, everyone can have their own copy of the player aid. Next, player pieces. Well, each player has a particular colour and they have a set of noble pieces, a stack marker and a set of faction markers. I'm only going to do one of these because players will do these simultaneously. So I'm going to use blue because, well, that's not my favourite colour, so I'll just use the blue pieces. Get out the blue pieces, here we are. As you can see, every player has their own set of noble pieces, um, which is a change from the original game. And they're two-sided, so we've got on one side the noble in the open field, and on the other side that same noble fortified. So when he's in a castle or a fortified town or city, you flip him over to show that. You also have faction markers in your colour, and uh, you also have a stack marker, which is this piece here, and that will go in a stacking zone and... Um, uh, if you have a large stack of nobles, you can put the stacking marker on the board and you can put the noble pieces in the stacking zone to avoid cluttering up the board. So that's the playing pieces. So we've taken our playing pieces, which is excellent. And of course, you can sort those out into any particular order you wish, uh, into alphabetical order or um, titled nobles, untitled nobles, however you would like. Now, what we next have to do is put our noble cards, our noble cards, face up in front of us in our faction space, and then award all the crown cards that we've been given to those nobles. So we'll we'll just quickly do that, and simultaneously we'll also indicate controlled locations and we'll place those noble pieces. And we'll just do this for one faction. So I'm, I'm going to do this for just for Beaufort. So we'll get rid of the other two. We'll normally give those two other sets to the other players in our game, but I'm doing this on my own, so just get that out of the way. So, first thing to do is, we don't actually need the preset faction card anymore, except that on the other side, there's a useful reminder of the sequence of play. So we'll keep that there. Right, we have four nobles. Two titled nobles, we have Beaufort and De La Pole, and we have Herbert and Hastings, or untitled. We have to offices. Now, offices can only go to titled nobles, either nobles like Beaufort with an intrinsic title, or an untitled noble who has a noble uh, has a title card, which is this salmon card one. Now, Herbert, Herbert, let's get him out of the way. He's easy. To, he's easy to do. Herbert, let's find his. We need to find his um, his counter. There it is, Herbert. Over here, here he is. Herbert goes in Land Stefan. That's his his castle. If you look at his card, it says on his card, his home card. Whoops, excuse me. 
His home car castle is Van Stefan 1B, and this map here says where it is. So he has to go on Van Stefan. He has no choice. That's his starting location. So your starting location is always just the home castle. You put him there. Now note, he's really close to George of Clarence in Cardigan. So one of the objectives early on could be just take control of George by sticking Herbert into Cardigan. So that's why he he goes there. Now, for various reasons, because he's in South Wales and he's got a role already, which doesn't involve him having to have any troops, generally, I wouldn't allocate anybody else to her, any other troops to her, but leave him probably with just his intrinsic 10 retinue. Uh, Earl of Kent, the Earl of Kent title card must be allocated to an untitled noble because a noble can only have one title. So we'll, we'll actually allocate that to Hastings. Uh, we generally we tuck these under like this so that you can see the, the troop strength on the card. The other stuff is public knowledge but isn't as important as the troop strength. So Hastings, he has to start in Ashby. He's only got one castle, one home castle. Ashby, and you can see. Ashby is right in the in the Midlands there. Let's find Hastings. The piece is over here. And he has to go in Ashby. And notice I'm putting him upside down. There's a fortified marker on, so we, should, we know he is actually in there. Uh, he uh, Nobles cannot be attacked in the first round. So they, they are, although they, they look like they might be vulnerable because they're on their own in a castle with only 100 garrison, they can't be attacked in the first round. So we have got a chance to move them. Now we come to offices. Now, um, Beaufort can have an office, uh, Duke of Suffolk Pole can have an office, or Hastings can have an office. Let's just see where they start, though, because that can determine how we allocate the cards. Uh, Beaufort, that's this guy here, again, he's only got one castle, Corfe, so he has to go in Corfe Castle, which is right down on the south coast. So he's, although he's handy for London, he's he's an extra move away for from the Midlands where the easily accessible Lancastrians are and he's even further away from any of the Yorkists. So he is not a particularly uh, high candidate for having a, a lot of troops because ideally what we're trying to do here is get ourselves a royal peace early in the game and the easiest ones to get are George of Clarence, Edward Isle March, Margaret of Anjou and Edward of Westminster, because they only require you to have 200 troops to take. Those last three only require you to have 200 troops to take them. So, for that reason, I'm going to leave both with, no, with not much in the way of troops. Which means that De La Pole is going to be Admiral, and Hastings is going to be Treasurer. Um, Pole actually starts in... Uh, over here in East Anglia, but Pole is on a road. Um, so that means that Pole can come down through London, because in Kingmaker 2, London doesn't block, towns don't block unless they're enemy controlled, and this is not neutral. He could come here and get up to Edward of Westminster by road, and which is not very far from Margaret of Anjou either. In fact, he could go, using a free move, he could go via either of these regions to Camelot. So. He is quite a power. He's in a good position to affect the Midlands. So we'll give him an office, we'll give him 80. Now, um, ideally, when we're looking at our faction, we want to not concentrate everything on one noble. <clears throat> I've already mentioned I don't really want to give Herbert anything else because he's just going to grab George, hopefully. And Beaufort is a bit out of, on a limb. So let's focus the rest of the stuff, mainly on Pole and Hastings. <clears throat> and I'd like to even them out. So let's make sure that they both have at least 100. Because then when we, if we move both of them together, we will have 200 troops. And that will enable us to take Margaret of Anjou or Edward of Westminster. So we give him Scott Archers. We'll give Hastings to Mother Arms. We'll split the towns between the two. So like so, and we've still got a bishop left, and well, we might not want to put all our eggs in those baskets, so let's make Beaufort Bishop of Lincoln. 
Now we do also have to complete the marking of controlled locations. All the all the locations, they're the fortified locations, indicated on the cards are ones that we control as a faction. So let's just mark those. You can optionally, you can mark all of them or you can just mark the ones on roads or ports. The, the, road, the ones that block roads and ports are the most important. So let's just do it quickly and just mark those. So uh, although we have Lincoln, we don't need to mark it because it's not on a road or a port. Lynn and Southampton from um, the Admiral are over here, right up there, and Southampton down in the south here. We also control Northampton and Swansea. Now, Swansea is not on a road, but it's a port, so we'll put a mark on Swansea. And we'll also put a marker on Northampton. Very important, controls the road. Um, and we also have Wallingford and Beaumaris through the Treasurer. So Wallingford does control the road from London to Bristol. And Beaumaris is a port all the way up here. So if we ever want to go to Anglesey, unlikely, we can actually go there. So we've marked, we've marked I think, all of our um, relevant locations that we control. So that gives us our starting position. Now, each noble acts as a unit. So Beaufort is a unit of 40 strength. Pole has got 110. Hastings has got 110. Herbert has got just 10. So Pole and Hastings together would be enough to take one of our towns uh, with a royal piece in it. So let's look at the next section. Um, the next section is ships. If your faction has ships, take the ship pieces and put them on their port and put the remaining ships by the border. So we do have ships because we have the Admiral. There are ship cards. We don't have uh, the blue ship cards, but we do have the Admiral. So looking over here, um, the Admiral actually has Southampton, ships of Southampton and Lynn. Here we are, Southampton Lynn. So again, we put these on one goes on Southampton, and they, they, again, these these are double-sided pieces. So on one side it's at sea, on the other side it's got a port symbol showing it's in port. So we can put it up that way. And similarly, up here with Lynn, again, use the port symbol to do that. The other the other ship counters. Well, we just need to stack them somewhere convenient for people to get hold of if they need them. So I tend to put them. Up here in Scotland. Scotland isn't used in Kingmaker 2, so we can use, put them up there out of the way. So we have done that section. That ships. Next, prestige point markers. Right. We count up each faction's starting prestige points. Now, I happen to know that each of the starting factions here has two prestige, but let's just show that so you can easily see the prestige points because. Bit of light on that, unfortunately. Let's move it now. It's this symbol here. So one, two. That's so. We will put one of our faction markers at the top of the board in the prestige points. Two. There we go. Prestige points done. Next, <coughs> after the prestige points, we have the alliances chart. So similarly, let's, let's move these all out of the way. But similarly. We put one of our markers on the alliances chart here. Now, uh, it's not actually vital to put them on at the start of the game, but um, you'd normally have one piece in each row. And when you ally, you are only acknowledged as formally allied if you put your marker into the same row as your allies. If you haven't done that, you're not officially allied. So there is a formal, it's a formal indication that you've allied. So you announce it and you put your marker in there and then you gain the benefits of alliance, which includes ganging up on your opponents um, and other benefits. This alliance is chart. Now we have stacking charge. I mentioned these already. So we have our little stack marker here. We put that in a stacking zone so that if we have a large stack of nobles, we can swap out the nobles, put them in here, put the stack marker on the area and we know 
um, we have the border less cl less cluttered. Then the, there are other markers as well. There's besieged alliance and king's peace markers, and let's get this out of the way. That's that's this collection of markers here. King's lovely, lovely, rather lovely king's peace marker. So again, I tend to put these up in Scotland or Ireland, get them out of the way. And these the the besieged marker looks like this. It's got a castle on it. That's only used if a siege attack fails because of bad weather. You put a besieged marker on the board. And again, I'll put them out of the way. And then there's the alliance marker. Actually, I tend to keep the alliance markers down here by the alliance's table. These are used to indicate the army strength of an alliance of stack um, and the prestige points of a, an alliance separate from the individual factions. I suppose. The next um, section and setup is the is setting up the event deck. Um, there's a little bit to this particular process because it's very important for control and flow of the game, the calling of Parliament, and it varies by number of players. So for this particular section, you will need the 92 cards of the event deck. Now I've split them up into bits because it's easier to show. So we've got most of the deck here. We also need to separate out the four Clamour for Parliament cards. I'll come to in a second. And we'll need a free move card for each player. So I've taken those out already. And we also need the Prestige Victory tile. So first thing first is we give each player a free move tile, a, a free move card. Get those out of the way. So each player will get one of those, get rid of them. Now, uh, what we must do next is shuffle up, shuffle up the remaining cards, not include, not including the clamours. That would be bad. We shuffle up these cards. These are actually already shuffled. Just push them out of the way. And then we take out a number of cards depending on the number of players. Um, and this is so that we, we're going to create the deck and put the prestige victory tile in the middle. So it's important that we remove some cards so that the, the pacing of the game is um, controlled with respect to the number of players. So you will draw more event cards with five players than you will with two or three, for example. So the deck size adjusts. So we take 37 out. Which sounds like a lot. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Come on, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-six, thirty-seven. That's right. They can all go. Those are only, these cards are only used if the event deck runs out during the game. Otherwise, they're just not necessary. Then we deal the remaining cards into four equal sized piles. Now, in, in a three player game, there should be 12 in each pile as a check that you've taken the right number out. And when I was doing this earlier, I only took out 27, so I didn't have the right number of cards. So it's quite important to just double check that. Um, I need to double check just by counting one of the piles. So here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that's fine. So we have our four piles of 12 cards. Then what we're going to do is put a clamour for palm in each one of these. 2, 3, 4. Shuffle each pile separately to make sure the clamour for palm is randomised within each pile. More or less. You can be as rigorous as you like with the shuffling. There we go. Finally, this one. Then we create the deck. We have one pile at the bottom, then another pile on top. Then we put the prestige victory tile in the middle, so it's right in halfway through, and then another pile on top of the prestige victory, and the final pile on the top. So you've got there the event deck with. Two clamours in the top half, two clamours in the bottom half, prestige tile in the middle. When you reach the prestige tile, prestige victory tile, that means you can you can actually claim a prestige victory if you have enough prestige points. So that created deck then goes, um, take this out, that, that created event deck then goes at the top of the board where it says event deck and we've got a space next to it for discards. So that has done.
that's a particular section. That's the event deck. And we're nearly, we are nearly finished now. That's, this is all, that creation of the event deck is all explained with a diagram and with text. Over the page, we just need the start player marker. And then we're ready. The start player in Kingmaker II is the player who controls the most senior Archbishop or Bishop in the order specified, Canterbury, York, Durham, Carlisle, Lincoln and Norwich. So for ease of looking things up, each of the preset faction cards has on it uh, where you've got a start player. So for example here in a three player game the asterisk there means Talbot's faction starts. That's because Talbot has the Bishop of Durham who is the most senior bishop of the three factions. So it's Talbot who will get our lovely start player marker and will take the first turn. So uh, that is how to set up Kingmaker II. Um, we'll just uh, make sure that we've got uh, a set of cards for both of them. In front of us, so just to recap, we will have a preset faction card, a free move we can use, and our allocated our allocated cards. We have, if you remember, we have Beaufort, we didn't have very much. We have our main troops in with Pole, Duke of Suffolk, and with Hastings, who is the Earl of Kent, and little old Herbert at the end there little old Herbert, very important and powerful figure <laughs> in the period. Herbert poised, ready to take George of Cardigan, um, at George of Clarence in Cardigan. So that's, that's how our faction looks at the start. And this is how our board looks at the start. But of course, there would be all the other faction nobles on there as well. And we've got the event deck and the crown deck in place um, we have the chancery space seeded with two cards and we have all the other cards we need down the right hand side so that concludes the setting up of kingmaker the second thank you very much for watching